And now, please welcome founder and co-CEO of Innis More, Sharan Pasricha, in discussion with Skift Senior Hospitality Editor, Sean O'Neill. So we believe our next speaker is the hottest hotelier in the world, and we believe that because he's doing something ex extremely difficult. He's doing lifestyle hospitality at scale, and so we're honored to have you here. Sharon, I appreciate you being here for Skift India Summit. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, uh, Rafat and team Skift for, uh, for the kind invitation. Yeah. It's great to uh, be here. So I believe you were born in India, so does being in Delhi today feel a little bit like a homecoming? Or? Yeah, this is kind of cool. So I was, I was born in Bombay. I think you can still call it Bombay if you were born there. Um, <laughs> and I left when I was 15 to move to England. So okay. uh, I um, come back fairly often, but this is the first time I'm on stage in India, so it kind of, feels kind of cool. That's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so maybe if we could have some visuals about the Ennismore property as well we're talking, but I'd like to start with what is lifestyle? So compared lifestyle to boutique and a, a traditional property. So I think um, it's, it's interesting, you know, you ask five people definitions of lifestyle, you get five <laughs> different definitions. Um, at the heart of what a lifestyle hotel is, is the idea of creating a hotel with soul. A big focus on design, big focus on creating programmatic spaces where you're designing bars and restaurants and public spaces really for locals as much as you are for hotel guests. A real focus and thinking about how you structure the programming. So it's, it's, it's considered, it's thoughtful, big focus on kind of design and a big focus on the F&B, which in our business is about 40 to 50% of our revenues is the restaurants and bars. So we take that incredibly seriously. 40 to 50% of your revenue comes from the food and that's the it. beverage. That's um, it. So, well, I would ask, like, so I, I believe that a lot of Indian uh, hoteliers and developers and investors believe that Indian hospitality is like, you know, the most sophisticated in the world. They're, they're savvy operators. And if they want to get into the lifestyle concept, they can go get a tattooed bartender, they can get some funky furniture, they can put some paint up, and they don't need Ennis Moore and your fees. So what, what is the case to make about why you have some magic that is useful to them? Okay, well, look, there's, um, I think, a, f a few uh, companies have tried to hire a fancy designer and a tattooed bartender, and that doesn't always necessarily make it a lifestyle hotel. So a lot of our brands, we have 17 brands, they're founder-led and founder-built. Um, they cut across the spectrum. You have Mama Shelter that was founded in Paris almost 20 years ago. Uh, with a real focus on design and building an amazing ecosystem of hotels at 150 euros a night. Um, you then have Hoxton, which I was intimately involved in, in building and creating, um, which is across Europe and the US. And there too, there's a big emphasis on design and, program and programming. I think what's really interesting about our stable of brands is they're really rooted in a purpose. Okay. Um, and that purpose flows through its point of view on design and food, but also the team. The team work there, they connect deeply with the brand, they connect deeply with what they're offering and the service levels, and I think that's incredibly hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm wondering if you could uh, talk a bit about the domestic pipeline here in India. I imagine that the major opportunity for Ennis Moore is Indian outbound travelers going to markets like the Middle East, uh, what is the potential at all for, or do, do you ever plan to have a lifestyle here in India? So I think, um, just to kind of take one step back, to, to help you understand our business. So we have three distinct verticals. We have a vertical called Lifestyle Collective with about 14 brands. These are brands like SLS, Mondrian, Delano, Mama Shelter, Hoxton, all founder-led, founder-built. Um, and, and, and cut across about 20 countries. We then have a vertical called Immersive Resorts. This was really built out of a brand called Rixos, which was founded in Turkey. And we have about 40 hotels um, across the Middle East and Seoul, across uh, Asia and, and, and Europe. And then we have a luxury restaurant business um, called Paris Society, which is really around iconic venues. Founded in Paris, we have about 80 venues, and we're now slowly expanding that across Europe. Uh, and, and Asia. So that's kind of the makeup of our business. I think 40, 
We have about 150 operating hotels, but about 160 in the pipeline. We're and that's a tremendous change because you, you, you got your first hotel in 2011, yeah. and now you have 150 and then 160 in the pipeline. That's, that's astonishing. That's been tough, Sean. I mean, I've kind of gone <laughs> to being the entrepreneur who's known everything about every one of my hotels to now knowing probably a little bit about, about most of them, mm -hmm. uh, which is hard because yeah. you know, I kind of enjoy being, being in the detail. Um, we have about 160 hotels in the pipeline. We have hot hotel operations in 35 countries today um, and about 30,000 members of, of the team. 40% of our pipeline is the Middle East, okay. an incredibly important market for us, but also an incredibly important feeder market uh, from India. So that's a big area of focus um, across Qatar, Saudi, uh, UAE, um, Abu Dhabi, um, and neighboring, neighboring areas. And is the Indian traveler ready for a lifestyle? When they, when they go to, say, Dubai, are they looking for a lifestyle property, or are they looking for some sort of traditional full service, uh, especially uh, my colleague Varsha Aurora was pointing out that like eight out of 10 uh, trips tend to have like family involved, and so I well, look, I think you know, there's currently 2% of global hotels are what we call lifestyle hotels, but 10% of hotels in construction are lifestyle hotels. So clearly, consumers are demanding a product that is more than a bed for a night. There will always be a space for a traditional hotel that is a room for a night. Um, our view is our hotels speak to a, an audience and a consumer that want more from that hotel. So these are individuals that use their hotel f for a coffee shop, use their hotel to go and work during the day, um, use their hotel to host events, um, and it's built around the local community. And it's, it's pretty hard to do, because when you're building a hotel in a neighborhood and you're trying to build restaurants and public spaces and coffee shops, you're competing against a high street venue which you know, um, cares as much, if not more, about an, un an understanding of that local community. So um, it's incredibly hard to do. Um, we've had some success in doing it. Um, when we opened, for example, the Hoxton in Paris, everyone told me the French would not go and get an espresso in a hotel <laughs> lobby. Um, and, and, and hopefully a few years later, we've demonstrated that um, if you build it, they will come. Similarly, in Amsterdam, we did the same. So I think if you create products at a good price point that's well designed, with a team that have good values that connect with the brand's ethos, um, and you're in interesting neighborhoods that have a core demographic around them, I think there's a great opportunity to do that. So let's talk a bit about your ownership structure. So you're a joint venture, and Accor is your largest shareholder. Um, so who else are uh, investors in NSMAR? Um, so it, it started out with, as a joint venture between Accor, Europe's largest hotel company, and myself. And it was a great meeting of minds because Accor had made considerable investments in a variety of lifestyle brands over the course of several years, 25 Hours, Mama Shelter, Morgan's Hotel Group with SBE. Um, and we put our businesses together in a joint venture 2021. And then last year, um, a Qatari consortium invested in the business, um, and they took a 10% stake. So we are now at three shareholders, um, and business is great. There, there, was a, there was an article in uh, Bloomberg earlier this month saying <laughs> that Anismore was looking for uh, additional funding. In the, uh, uh, is that true? Wow, I thought this was a softball uh, interview, <laughs> but there you're going straight for it. Um, I, look, we're always open to have strategic conversations with individuals and parties that can add value to what we do. We're in the business of creating a global lifestyle hospitality platform. We're growing incredibly fast. We're in some of the most exciting neighborhoods and cities. We really enjoy having conversations with folks that feel they can add to our business. We're an asset light business. We don't buy real estate. We don't invest in real estate. But we always have conversations with folks that okay. we think can add value. So something new last year was you created a new loyalty program called Disloyalty. Um, I love the name. Uh, so what is it and how's it going? So Disloyalty was really um, in response to us thinking disruptively about loyalty schemes. Everyone's aware of how traditional loyalty schemes work. They're point-based, and you've kind of got to graduate to various tiers. And we thought to ourselves, well, what does is, what is a lifestyle customer want from a loyalty program? And we kind of worked out, well, 
They sort of don't want points. They sort of don't want tears. They want instant gratification. Um, how do we create a program that gives them that instant gratification of being forever enamored with Spotify and Netflix and subscription models? So I thought, wouldn't it be cool to kind of connect a subscription model to the idea of, of kind of instant gratification? And then we looked at our business, and we said, well, how do we, for a company like ours that's growing incredibly fast, we have more hotels in our pipeline than we have operating, how do we actually reward people to try new places and give them bigger discounts to try new places. So we've got a very clear rewards program. It's 10 euros or $12 a, a, a month. It gives you core benefits, but it rewards you more to try new places. So we open about 30 hotels a year. Every new hotel that we open, within the first three months, you get 50% off. 50% uh, off. Five zero. Mm -hmm. It's a big number. Yeah. You get 20% off your first day, and then 10% thereafter. You get free coffees in every one of our hotels, if you sit down and, and order, and 10% off F&B. So five core benefits, and we've just seen an incredible love for um, the program because you have people that go, hang on a minute, I live near a mama shelter or a Hoxton, or I travel regularly to so-and-so place, or do you know what? I've looked at their pipeline and I've seen they're opening in Jakarta, Maldives, Bangkok, and New York. That's incredibly interesting because I can get you know, just by booking one stay, I can get my $200 subscription fee back in discounts just on one stay. So we've had enormous success, um, and it's disruptive. And again, when you're trying to create something new that you know, doesn't quite exist and is, and, is, and is challenging the status quo, you always come, kind of come across a few you know, instant hurdles, and you kind of zig and zag your way through it. But we're delighted with the response we've had from disloyalty um, and how it connects the different regions and markets that we're working on and how it connects the different brands. We find that most of our disloyalty members come to us because of their affinity with one of our brands, but within three months, they book another brand uh, oh, immediately, which is kind of cool. I like the, so my, uh, our Skiff's co-founder, uh, Jason, lives in London, and he, he's very hard to impress about anything. He but told me, he told me he got, <laughs> he he told me he got hustled them. by one of our, uh, by one of our servers, and he told me he's made his money back. So apparently, I'm writing him a check every time he has a coffee. He says he he has six coffees a month, and it basically pays for the subscription. So there you are. Um. Um, I'm wondering. Uh, we have an audience question here, and if people have questions, they can put it in the app. So, do you include local artisans, chefs, uh, to contribute to authentic experiences at your lifestyle properties? Absolutely, 100%. Um, you know, we have about 400 restaurants uh, across all of our venues, and the only way you win and build restaurants that are credible with locals is through partnerships. So we enter every new jurisdiction, every new country, every new community, every new town with a sense of humility. Um, we send a team well before to really understand the local landscape, who are the, you know, who are the tastemakers, who are the chefs, who are the operators, who are the partners that we think can really build a restaurant that's just not the, you know, successful for one month, three months, one year, but really integrates well within the community. Um, and that takes, that takes a lot of skill and time, and we, you know, we get it right more often than we get it wrong. Um, but you know, the times that we do get it wrong, we're very quick to kind of pivot and, 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 and reconcept and, and really think out of the box. So that's a big and, and, and huge integral part of our team uh, and our ethos. We have a, a team called Carte Blanche within our business. It's one of our studios, one of the four studios that, that I work closely with. And their only job and responsibility is to connect with the local communities we're, we're opening in. And that means doing just that, finding local chef partners and local operators to kind of help with our F&B. So the, one of the running themes of this event is sort of like this discussion of whether you build tech in-house or whether you outsource it. And you, one part of Ennismore and your design is like you're hands-on about all guest facing experiences, yeah. and so the interface is important. I believe you've said that your central booking system on the website, you actually built that in mostly yeah. in-house, is that right? That's it. So are you, is that just for one brand, or is that something you're expanding? No, for? I mean, I guess five years ago, I, um, I, I went on this journey, because we care so much about the physical spaces in all of our hotels. We were kind of, we were kind of offered limited options, should we say, with the digital journey. On our, on our website because you could kind of... Many tools are very generic or not very... You could align with a white label operator and you just kind of insert your images, in, but you basically lose control 
of your guests um, the second they go on the booking platform. And that just didn't sit well with me. So five, six years ago now, we hired our first um, software developer, our first product manager, and we started building our own APIs to connect directly into Opera. Um, anyway, six, six years and 40 software developers later, we now have uh, an incredible team that I think is world class. Um, for the Hoxton.com, which we built ourselves, 50% of our business comes directly on our brand.com, which is, 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 is pretty amazing at industry leading con conversion rates and um, you know, fantastic optimization. We're now rolling that out across all of our 17 brands. Um, by the end of this year, we'll have 100 hotels on our own custom booking engine, which is kind of cool. Um, so I think a combination of having really strong product managers that understand how to build amazing products, but also great software, software engineers that connect directly into um, APIs, into the PMS, um, has, been, has been great. The other part of one of our studios, which is called AIM Studios, which is all around design. Um, you know, design is so subjective, but being insightful and thoughtful about how you can create spaces, um, whether it's coffee shops or restaurants or bars or rooftops, uh, has been a big part of our success. So we have about 50 designers on staff. Um, we get asked by our owners to design some of our hotels. That's cool. Uh, which is, which is kind of great to have. So it operates autonomously. Um, it's a separate design function, but they feed in to a lot of the work that we do. Another audience question. So can Sharon speak on p future potential mergers in the industry, such as in Dubai's restaurant sector? <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel that's a loaded question. Um, I mean, look, the, the, you know, the, there's, if it's relating to us and Ennismore, um, we're always actively um, pursuing and having discussions with a variety of uh, people and partners. There's no way you can build a global business on your own. You, you, the way to do that is by aligning with some incredible founders, amazing entrepreneurs, and great businesses. So we're always, we're always having interesting conversations with people. OK, cool. And what might a lifestyle hotel in India look like? That's a, very, that's a great question. I mean, um, you know, part of me being here is to, is to kind of meet with owners, developers, operators, and try and understand what that hotel would look and feel like. To my mind, um, every lifestyle hotel, you, know, you cannot copy paste. Every hotel requires a real localization, a real aspect of understanding design that feels local, restaurants and bars that feel local, art, culture, programming that feels local. So uh, we'd love the opportunity to kind of put our hand up and, and use, one, you know, use one of our brands within the, within the Indian context. Uh, we've got a couple of deals cooking. I don't think we've got anything ready to announce. I was kind of hoping we could announce something uh, on stage today, but hopefully before the end of the year, we'll have one or two deals to to announce in India. OK, very exciting. Uh, we have a next guest after this is uh, Ritesh, a famous entrepreneurial story here in India. And so many people in the audience are interested in sort of entrepreneurial journeys. And it was in, in 2011 you opened your first hotel. That was owned and operated. Now you have about 150 under management. You have another 160 in the pipeline. So for people in the audience, what, ha what was the opportunity that you sort of saw that others didn't? And what was it about your execution that enabled this journey? Sure. That's a good question. I think for my own personal entrepreneurial journey, um, I stumbled across a hotel in East London that I fell in love with. Here was a hotel that was underinvested in. It was a bit tired, um, but it symbolized so much of the area that it was in. So it was in an in in industrial part of town called Shoreditch, um, very industrial, but becoming very creative. And for me, there was a disconnect between this amazing, vibrant neighborhood and the actual hotel. And I thought to myself, well, what if, what if you connected this amazing, vibrant neighborhood that had art and culture and music and food with the hotel, what would that look and feel like? So I was in an incredibly lucky position to be able to take over that hotel, moved in, um, and realized that actually by making subtle changes and, and, and connecting the neighborhood with the hotel, in the case of the Hoxton, um, it dramatically transformed that business. So um, within the India context, I'd love the opportunity to be able to build a hotel in Mumbai, build a hotel in Gurgaon, build a hotel in Delhi, and uh, Goa, pretty cool, uh, and yeah. adapt the same mindset. So we have an audience question about subscriptions. And because you've given a lot of thought to the subscription model, is there any advice to like, the Indian hospitality market and how they could take advantage of it, similar to how you're playing around with disloyalty as yep. a subscription model? Well, I think, I think there's, 
there's always the give-get equation, right? So it's, it's what, what do I get if I give up you know, subs? If I give up the subscription fees, what am I getting in return? So you've got to make sure it's really easy. So everything we've done as a business has always been around making clear the proposition. And in the case of disloyalty, you know, it would have been so easy to just complicate life and make sure um, it was a lot harder to understand. We didn't want to have tiers. We didn't want to create different levels. We wanted to create one system that everyone could understand. And it was very easy for somebody to work out, OK, I live near these hotels. Jason, I'm going to have a coffee twice a week. Coffee costs four bucks. It's going to cost me x. I'm going to very quickly, my 200 pound investment is going to pay back. So that's great. I travel regularly to these cities. My 20% discount across these cities is going to be worth X. It's going to be pretty easy. I've got my honeymoon coming up. We just opened the So in Maldives. A 50% discount across the So in Maldives is going to more than pay for <laughs> the 200 pound subscription. That's an easy win. So I think creating the proposition, because you know, it's not a one size fits all. You've got different customers and different folks that would look at the loyalty scheme slightly differently. And I think tailoring it to that type of customer is important. And then you've got to get the team behind it, because the reality is we have it's millions. It's a different mindset, right? It's a different mindset. We have millions of people that walk in and out of our venues. And you know, we started out thinking, how do we acquire customers? Maybe we acquire customers outside of our hotels. And then you know, weeks into that, we realized we have literally millions of people that walk in and out of our venues every single day, using the bars and restaurants, using the hotel rooms. Well, let's, let's connect with them. Let's talk to them. And then it's about rallying the troops within the business, so rallying the F&B teams, rallying, rallying the co-working teams, rallying the rooms teams, and really giving them an alignment and incentive to talk to people about disloyalty. And I think that's been a uh, great success. Cool. And then maybe we close on a big picture question. The, the India is a very exciting moment for India. You can feel the rise of it in, in terms of cultural prominence around the globe, but also in the second half of this century, it should be the economic super, superpower of the world. So what excites you right now about the India story? Well, look, I think you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a proud Indian. Um, I spend most of my time outside of India, but I kind of look at India and view India as this incredible opportunity. You've got the most exciting middle class that's growing, that's traveling, that's getting more exposed to brands. And yeah, there's an amazing opportunity to not just have an amazing population of folks that travel abroad to whether it's the Middle East or, or Asia uh, and Africa, but more importantly, to create brands within, within, uh, within, within India. And of course, um, you know, you've got the Yoyo founder after, you know, after me who's going to no doubt talk about his incredible uh, journey. But I think there's, I won't be surprised if the next end is more, the next wave of lifestyle brands actually comes from India. So we'll be watching by the wayside and hopefully we can be part of, part of that journey as well. Good note to end on. Thank you, Sharon, Thank you, for being here. Really Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.